Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? <clears throat> uh, yeah, pretty fired up, right? That, uh, that really got the, the juices going after uh, what feels like uh, a month here already at the con convention, if you're working, let me tell you. Um, so I'm going to talk about voting. Um, I want to talk about what we're doing to actually make a change. How is it that we're going to do the things that we're all talking about at this convention and beyond? And this isn't you know, an easy question. This is something, that's, uh, something that we struggle with every day uh, because there are a lot of barriers to this. There are a lot of challenges associated with our community uniquely that, are not, that you, can, you will not see in other communities. And so I want to just start with sort of the, fact, the facts. Let's start with the, the basics. So number one, this is from the Public Religion Research Institute. No religious group is larger than those who are unaffiliated from religion. Nearly one in four Americans are now religiously unaffiliated. That's a big number. Here's the chart. Going back to the 1970s, we were under 10% for quite some time until the explosion of atheism in the 1990s into the 2000s and now. The internet, as Alhadra said, is part of that. The ability to reach outside of our groups, to reach outside of our communities, and find people like us is the most, the most powerful way for us to meet and grow. Young adults, I see many of you here, are more than three times as likely as seniors to identify as religiously unaffiliated. 38% of young adults, people under 30, are non-religious, are religiously unaffiliated. This isn't, this isn't just, this isn't a coincidence, this isn't just luck, this is the growth of communication. This is, again, reaching outside of our local communities, this is reaching outside of our states, this is reaching all across the world to find kindred spirits, so to speak. Here's the breakdown. That big purple bar at the top there is unaffiliated. The far left stack is 18 to 29. Look at age 65 and over. You can compare the difference and just see. And it's not just that people get more religious as they get older. That's not what's happening here. We're slowly seeing that bar moving over and that the unaffiliated really expanding. The number of unaffiliated, though, doesn't tell the whole story. This is not a group that is just one cohesive block. We are not the Southern Baptist Convention. I think that's obvious based on the exhibitors out there and, and who I'm looking at here. Um, but for young people, this is the key. Atheist is no longer a bad word. Among that 24% of Americans who are unaffiliated or non-religious or nuns, N-O-N-E-S, not nuns and like habits and things. <laughs> that, they're not all atheists. Um, many of them d believe in God. But they certainly agree with us more than they agree with our friends on the religious right. <laughs> but they're not atheists, and they don't embrace the word atheist. And it's the thing that uh, my, my, my boss, Dave Silverman, likes to... Uh, worry about and think about how he's going to, you know, insert the word atheist more often, and it's the thing that keeps him up at night is, why aren't they just calling themselves atheists? <laughs> and we, we have this constant battle of how do we talk about these people in a simple way without hedging and quantifying and uh, cutting them down into this little tiny thing. One of the good pieces of news here is that we may not have to uh, in about 10, 20 years, because among teens, so I'm talking 13 to 18, so the, the Generation Z, I think is what we've settled on. Um, the percentage of teens who identify as atheists, not just non-religious, atheist, is double that of even my generation. So right here, uh, this is the US, this is a survey done by an actually a religious group trying to figure out why are all these young people leaving our churches? <laughs> and uh, it's a very fascinating read because you go through and they're like, oh, they no longer think morals are absolute. Oh, 
There's a lot of, uh, hand, uh, you know, uh, falling into uh, fainting couches and things in this entire uh, report. It's a very interesting read. But that number there, 8, 8 13, 14, um, atheist is the blue one. That's 13. 13%. Agnostics, they're atheists. That's 8%. That's 8%. But 21% of these people of this Generation Z are atheists, not just non-religious, atheists. And this is probably, you know, kind of underestimating a little bit because they were, you know, working for a client of uh, religious folks and like, oh, don't worry, the problem isn't that bad. It's, it's bad, but it's not that bad. Um, so these numbers are actually lower than what we see in uh, independent research done by groups like PRRI uh, or Pew. And so I bet this is even a little bit higher. But this is, this is the kicker. The non-religious are now the country's largest voting block. Well, what is a voting block exactly? Don't clap yet. We're not there. <laughs> what is a voting block? It's a group of people that politicians look to and, and can message toward and can appeal to and can say, hi, evangelicals. Or, I'm sorry, let me, let me do this as Donald Trump. I love the evangelicals. I love them all. No one's been greater to me than the evangelicals. Now, the evangelicals are obviously not homogenous. They are not one, one religious group or one religious denomination. They have lots of disagreements, just like we do. But they vote like they are one homogenous group. 81% of evangelicals voted for Donald Trump in the 2016 election. Here are, here's what the voting blocks look like. In 2016, among registered voters, registered voters, non, no religion is 21%. We have just passed Catholics and white evangelicals. All right, 21% of, of registered voters. That's like 52 million people, all right? But when you look at who actually votes, it's not quite there. We could shake up American politics, but there are a lot of roadblocks in the way, in, in the way here, and I'm gonna talk about some of those. So this is the problem. If you look at the chart on the left, religious, or voter turnout for religious group, religious nuns. 25% of the electorate, or 25% of, of US adults are religiously unaffiliated, but only 14% <clears throat> of the electorate, of, of the people who actually voted, were non-religious. We're not showing up. And why is that? Well, there's a lot of reasons. But Catholics, Protestants, are much more likely than religious nuns to vote. You can see that both Protestants and Catholics outperform their size in the electorate. 49% in the general population, 52% in the actual election for Protestants. Now, they didn't break it out by evangelicals, but um, the interesting thing there is evangelicals outperform even more. This is a problem, and the reason is multifaceted. We have the numbers to win elections and to swing elections. This election was decided by about 80,000 votes in three states. 80,000, and we undervoted, we underperformed our numbers by 11%. 11% of 50 million, that's a lot. So what, what's the difference? What do politically powerful religious groups have that we don't? Well, they have churches, that seems kind of obvious, but they also have one thing that we're never going to have, intense faith in their church's positions and a sense of moral certainty. We don't have church positions. We always like to say atheism is the answer to precisely one question, do you believe in God? But that's not all that our groups stand for, and there's, we can get into that in a minute. They have really tight social circles that enforce compliance with the tenets and norms of their church. And they have built-in social penalties to people going outside of the church to do stuff. 
and competing for their resources. In the 1970s, churches, especially evangelicals, viewed politics as a dirty business, as something that was corrupt and corrupting, something that would damage their religious, religion, their religion, would damage their churches, would damage their congregations. The election of Jimmy Carter as, as a Southern Baptist, as a vocal Southern Baptist, changed that. And they were very activated by that change. And since then, and now the rise of the moral majority and the Christian right and the uh, Family Research Council and all this, since then, I think the people in the 1970s may have been right. They've corrupted and they're corrupting. And we see it now. We see it in the polling with Donald Trump where there was a flip <clears throat> in the number of people who said that to be a good president, you had to share my religious views. It went from 70 or 80 percent in the Obama administration to like 20 or 30 now among evangelicals. Now they're saying he's not the pastor in chief, he's just banning abortion and kicking out gay people. And that's what they want. So they're, they're, a lot of ink has been spilled writing the, the evangelicals have sold their soul to Donald Trump stories. A lot of ink has been spilled on that. When the elites in the church make an issue salient by speaking out on it and by engaging their people with their deep-seated moral beliefs. So when they talk about things and frame it as a moral fight, as a fight about the morals of the country, as an attack on their beliefs, those church networks really facilitate rapid mobilization. Among these churches, there are there's a huge amount of work that gets done in these churches. They really focus inward, and they discourage people from participating in outside activities, in outside groups, in being in parts of coalitions, except on these key moral issues. This was what led to the rise of the religious right, an agreement on abortion and LGBT issues. And on everything else, they don't care. That's all it is. These churches tend to be very strict. They have a lot of really strict rules. No drinking, no dancing. That's, that's the thing. Um, prohibitions on um, certain types of you know, sexual activity or, or whatever. Uh, subjugation of women. Uh, unequal treatment. That's a really high social cost to pay unless you are, tr you are a true believer. And then it's, that's the price of admission and you are willing to pay it because God has ordained it. But what this does is it, it roots out the people who maybe don't hold the faith quite as tightly, that aren't quite as committed to that religious view. And because of that, it creates a feedback loop that reinforces the church's dogma, makes it more extreme, but also increases the fervence of the believers and the power that they have to organize. Evangelicals in today's political environment thrive on distinction, separating themselves out from everyone else, on engagement, on creating conflict and threat. We see it in the rhetoric from the religious right constantly. We are under attack. They are attacking our way of life. They are trying to turn us into communist Russia, right? They see secularism itself a secular society, and secular values as a direct attack on their way of life. They're able to mobilize quickly in opposition to these attacks. It doesn't mean that they're always engaging. It doesn't mean that churches are constantly involved in their communities and engaged in politics. It means that when something comes up, pardon the expression, but hell hath no fury, they are able to mobilize a response that is so overwhelming that no politician dares cross them until starting now. All these things, all this social control, all this rooting out people that aren't, aren't, are just, aren't just like us or you know, imposing all these costs on, on our communities, all of this like wagon circling, forcing people to remove people who aren't 
uh, who, are, who are apostates and who are blasphemers. Get them out of the community. We don't, we're gonna, you need to disassociate from them. You need to kick them out of your life. These aren't things that we have, and they're not things we want. <laughs> Churches have very powerful organizing tools that we have no interest in duplicating because we have better values. But here are some things they have that maybe we do want. Churches that are less hierarchical. So I'm talking about evangelical churches. There is no mothership like there is for the Catholic Church. Evangelical churches offer opportunities to individuals for leadership, for engagement, for public speaking, for all these things, running meetings, organizing events, volunteering within the church that when the time comes, translate well to politics. They have tight-knit social groups that provide support for one another. If something happens with the family, you have a people to lean on, you have a shoulder to cry on, you have somebody who's going to bring by a casserole dish with something covered in mayonnaise. <laughs> I'm from the Midwest, so, you know. Um, you have that, and it's important, and it's, but it's not unique to religion. There is nothing inherently religious about when a loved one dies, bringing over a hot dish. So let's not pretend that it is. Let's build communities that have that. And finally, they have members. They have social networks that are ready to go as targets for political organizing. I've, I've done this for a pretty long time now. The best way to get somebody involved in your mission is to be their friend. It's to have a friend who is not yet part of it and bring them in. The, best, the most effective way to get someone to vote is for me to be your friend and me to bring you with me. The most effective way for you, me to get you to donate is to ask you as a friend. We're friends, guys. Go donate. There are things like ceremonies and, and community and history and shared language for discussing events. All those things are very powerful at organizing churches, but also organizing in politics. So we need to separate out the good from the bad. The bad, moral certainty, dogma, the, the crap that comes along with religion. Enforced compliance with norms. So kicking people out because they want to help out in some other thing because they don't want to spend all their time volunteering at the church, kicking those people out. We don't want that. What we do want are easily salient issues, things that we care about, things that we can translate into shared values for our community, even if we don't agree on everything. There is something to be said about accountability rather than shunning and social pressure from within the group. The social pressure is what drags people to the polls. It's what gets people to go register to vote. It's what gets people to donate. It's what gets people to support, to volunteer, to do all these things. That's not shunning, that's relationships. We do this all the time in our day-to-day -day lives. We have a friend group, we have you know, people that we care about who aren't our family necessarily, but we have social values, we have mores, we have things that we care about, and people who repeatedly undercut that or do things that are counter to those values, we hold them accountable. And we don't shun them. We try to change their minds. We try to make them better. But we hold them accountable. And the last part of this, instead of having penalties for participating in outside things, we want loyalty to the group. We want to build a community that people feel loyal to because it's a group they want to be a part of. Not just because it has the A word in it, not just because it says whatever, not because it's Baptist or this or that, but because you want to be part of it. Building a community that everybody or that as many people are proud of and that reflects well on, on our community, that's what we have to do. That's the type of groups that we need to be building. Those are the communities that we have to have and the people who are gonna build them are the people in this room. So let's talk about building those communities. We need to provide opportunities for leadership and activism. 
We gotta develop spokespeople and we gotta develop political skills. What that means is we have to work on organizing, we have to empower people who want to help and get them in the fight. We need to organize around our shared values and issues of concern for group members. I said this earlier, atheist is an answer to one question, but triangle free thought or tri-state free thinkers or Oklahoma, atheists of Oklahoma or the atheist community of Tulsa, they are a group that can organize around the things that their members care about. Just because they have one thing in common, atheism, doesn't mean that they can't go outside of that and use these tools and, and be visible as atheists and work within that value structure that the group has and not be, not be too worried about asking somebody to, to leave if they're, they're making your members uncomfortable and they're you know, harassing people. Just, this isn't a suicide pact, atheism. We shouldn't hold ourselves hostage when people are uh, making our groups work less well. The people who get out there and kick ass are usually the people you want to be friends with. The, the people who make everybody's life miserable and just sort of pop up and, and you know, ask stupid questions and uh, make people and harass people and make people uncomfortable, they very rarely do anything except that. They spend a lot of time on those things. So here's what we're better at. We're better at focusing our activism externally. Churches re re require everybody to kind of be in one little cloistered section here. Because when you get outside of the church world, you find, oh, all these other things, or all these things that I actually like about church, they're available elsewhere. Ugh. Or they see things like uh, Richard Dawkins' videos. You know, when you go out, when you get outside that bubble, that's when doubts start to happen and you start losing asses and pews. So we need to be visible to the broader community as atheists. We need to get out there and if your group, if your local group cares about LGBT rights, and you should, if you care about those things, get out there and organize and show up as atheists. Get to pride, table at pride, get in the pride parade. Work on non-discrimination ordinances. This is the biggest fight right now in church-state separation because they're writing in exemptions from all the laws, all the civil rights laws, all the protections. So all you have to do is say, you know, I, I really don't, I, uh, my religion tells me that I shouldn't have to uh, rent a house to, or rent an apartment to this person. Or my religion tells me that um, my mortuary shouldn't have to hire a trans person. Fuck you. This is, this is, we can have reasonable debates about reasonable topics. Whether civil rights laws should apply to everybody is not one of those reasonable debates. We, this is settled, we settled it in the 1960s, we settled it again in the 1970s, this is done. So we gotta fight for it, and we have to be the people ready to fight for it, because when we show up to help and fight on these issues, we build a relationship, and then we're friends. And then when the next thing comes along that is an atheist issue or that's just a church-state separation issue or is a, we want to put in God we trust in every public school and require that it be displayed, guess who shows up to help? The people we helped already because we've built that relationship. We're also better at adapting to changing social mores and values. I'm not talking about sticking your finger in the wind and seeing where it's blowing, but I am talking about religions that still think that, you know, the earth is 5,000 years old. We're, we're much better than them at looking at evidence and adapting because it's not built into our structure that we have the ever, uh, everlasting, unchanging, eternal word of some all-powerful deity guiding our values. We're humanists. We have values that are based on helping one another and based on making this life the best life possible. Atheism by itself is not a salient identity for the full 24% of Americans who are non-religious. Or put another way, non-religion is not a salient identity. 
It's, it's not the thing that gets people out of bed and compels them to go organizing. But here's the thing. It doesn't have to be. 24% would make us the largest voting bloc in the country. But we don't have to be the largest voting bloc in the country. Think about the power that the Mormon religion has. Think about the power that uh, the, 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 the Jew Jewish religion has. That how many people reach out to rabbis to make sure that they're doing the right thing. Actively secular nuns, we're going to say, represent something like 8 to 10% of the population. But that is more than the number of Southern Baptists. And how often do we see religious folks going and sucking up to Southern Baptists? How often do politicians go to their conventions and welcome them to, the, to their city? How often do political candidates go and talk to them to get their blessing? We also are five times as many as large as Mormons. How many Mormon politicians can you think of offhand? A lot. I can think of a recent presidential nominee who is a Mormon. How many atheist politicians at the national level can you think of? There is one member of the United States House of Representatives who came out as a non-believing humanist. I don't think he used the word atheist. Um, that would be Representative Jared Huffman of California. And there is religiously unaffiliated Kirsten Sinema who is running for Senate in Arizona. So what we need to do, and I'll tell you, this is, this is the, the trick as a political organizer. Focus on the people who already agree with you but aren't active. It's much easier to activate people than it is to convince people. The convincing will happen on some level naturally because we're right. <laughs> but it's not automatic. We have, to, we have to talk about our values in a language that's accessible to everyone. We have to wear it on our sleeves. We have to be vocal. We have to be proud. We have to be engaged. The number one thing that young people think of when they think about evangel evangelical Christianity is hypocrisy. Because they talk and they talk, but they don't walk the walk. We need to talk about our values and we need to put them into practice by going out there every day and fighting for religious equality, fighting for secular government, fighting for our rights, fighting for our rights, fighting for everyone's rights, and talking about that in a way that, that is clear, that is understandable, that is appealing and accessible to everyone. And we need to translate all of that into, we'll call it a platform. But we need to do that and we need to be clear about it. And then all of you, you group leaders, you activists in your local states, in your local, in your cities, you are the ones who are going to do that. And you need to empower the people who are excited about that type of organizing, that are excited about working in coalitions. You need to empower those people and promote them and, and get them going and get them trained. Send them, to, um, send them to trainings. There are trainings out there. If you are running a local group and you say, listen, I have no idea how to do this, find a training. There are lots of uh, really fantastic groups that will help you make budgets, do bylaws, do organizing. There are a million right now trainings for activism because there's a lot of energy out there for some reason. <laughs> Who'd have thought? We don't have to organize the full quarter of non-religious Americans. But what we do have to do is organize the people, the nuns, the atheists who are like the people in this room, the people who are showing up and are using this as a salient identity that, that think of themselves as atheists or as non-religious people and they're fired up about that. And on the side, we should be also doing outreach and, and being visible because when people see that, they say, ah, wow, that really, this is exactly what happened to me. I, I saw atheism and I said, wow, I'm very much in favor of the right to choose. I'm in favor of a comprehensive education, medically accurate sex ed. I'm in favor of science. I'm in favor of all these things. And what is the common enemy to those things right now in American politics? Religion. And so the more we can show up and be visible as atheists, the more the group grows naturally, but the more we, we also need to focus on just organizing the people we already have and taking our groups to the next level. 
by replicating the things that churches are doing and doing well and that are helpful, but not using the things that run counter to our values. So here's, here's the rundown. We need to encourage our existing groups to organize around a few, key word is a few, important political issues. Have three things, two or three things that your group cares about that you want to fight, you want to fight for. And get out there and do it. Doesn't mean that's all you do. You should still provide the community for people who are leaving religion or who have left religion, who that's the reason that they were in church. Huge number of people do not care about the dogma in their church. What they care about is the support network. If we can replicate that, our numbers continue to grow. We have to increase visibility of our community in public discourse. That means going to your elected officials as atheists and talking about whatever issue concerns you. It means being visible as an atheist if you ever talk to the media. It means going to city council meetings and saying, hi, I'm an atheist and here's why this matters to me. It means showing up to volunteer at the soup kitchen and saying, oh, I'm with Tri-State Freethinkers, I'm with uh, Tulsa, or a Atheist Community of Tulsa, and maybe getting thrown out. <laughs> or, getting, or getting your money, your donation refused. Who knows? But it means that you're being visible as an atheist, and you're breaking down those stereotypes that, that, that all we're concerned about. People think, and this is a question I, I got asked multiple times when I was, uh, we were getting ready for this convention. So what do you guys talk about? Do you just get in a room and talk about how God doesn't exist? And I said, no, we've pretty much settled that one. <laughs> I'm just going to get up on stage for my next speech, and I'm just going to say, God isn't real, God isn't real, God isn't real. And I, I guess they think everyone just breaks into a wild applause at the, <laughs> the mere mention of that. I said, no, we're talking about what we can do to make this country, this world, this life better because we are the ones who have to do it. We have, uh, we just got some protest signs printed up um, that, that, that are ready to go and that will be available on our store when we get back home that say, thoughts and prayers, and prayers is crossed out, and then in big letters it says, action. And could you imagine, for those of you who have been around for, uh, you know, if you've got the 10-year button, the five, even the five-year button or the 20-year button, think about how unthinkable it would have been when we first started doing this, when you first started attending, to have half the United States Senate, to have half the United States House, to have children organizing, saying, fuck your thoughts and prayers, action is what we need. Think about how difficult that would have been to imagine five, ten years ago. And now this is, this is the new normal. This is what we're seeing. And we have to be the ones to put that action into place. I'm not going to stand up here as the National Program Director for American Atheists and say that your group should go march uh, for gun control. Because that's not, we don't we're not going to take a position on that. But what I'm going to tell you to do is to look at the evidence to make a decision for yourself as a group, as an individual, and decide where your values lie. And decide what you want to do as an atheist, and then show up yes. and be an atheist in the room and so that they know when we need help that we're there to help and that we are one community and that we are the people making the change. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I've got about uh, five minutes for questions here, so I'm happy to, to take a couple. Um, if anybody has anyone, or if you're just ready to go out and do some organizing, by all means. <laughs> Nick? You can get the PowerPoint to use locally. Sure. Um, I will make it available. Um, let's see. Best way to do this. What state are you in? Texas. 
Texas, okay. Um, we'll, uh, we'll send it to our, um, I'm trying to think of the, you know what I'm gonna do? Um, we'll, we'll put it up on the convention website um, and, I, and we'll send, we have an email that'll go out with uh, a, a survey after the convention as well. So maybe I'll just wrap it up in there or, or send it as a separate thing as well. Thank you. Totally easy to do. Nick, so, you were mentioning that religious groups have penalties for participating in outside activities. Can you right. give some examples of those? Because I just don't think I heard you give any as you were talking. Sure. So um, one, this is something that is common among evangelical groups. And the, the, I don't have any really great examples other than um, groups like the, you know, the LDS Church, the Mormon Church, um, really conservative evangelical type groups strongly encourage their members to only do things that are, um, that are sanctioned by the church. So the Mormon Church, for example, um, if you're a, I was in the Boy Scouts, and I think probably a lot of, a lot of us were. Um, the Boy Scouts is one of like two authorized uh, social activities for young men and for boys. And, it, and, and th that's what you have to do. Like that's just a requirement of being in the church that if you want to send your kid to a social event, they can go to the Boy Scouts or they can do a mission. And that's about it. And uh, there, are, there are other things as well. But it's about like the internal organizing of those groups. So you're, you help at the church soup kitchen. You don't help at the other soup kitchen down the street. You help at the church clothing drive, not at Salvation Army is a bad example. It's very much a... Well, yeah, it's not like they find them, it's a, but you can, you can get kicked out, you can, you know, you have a meeting with the pastor uh, who, you know, I'm very concerned about your conduct, that sort of thing. Uh, it's very, it's social pressure, but it's explicit social pressure, not just from within the peer group, but also from the leadership. So, uh, yeah. You started out talking about uh, voting, and I think that that's something that everybody in this room should, and you should make it the, the core part of what you talk about, mm -hmm. because one of the things that I bet as a show of hands, how many people in here know who their state representative or state senator are? You actually know who they are? Yeah. Well, very good, because then you need to go back to the people in your community who don't, because many of them don't. And the only thing these people care about at the state level and at the federal level, but don't even worry about them, at the state level, if they never see your face or never hear from you, they could... They could care less what yep. you have going for you Absolutely. because because the vote is what they're concerned about. And that's one of the things you'll find as you start. So because you're going to go through that. I've gone through it in Louisiana. If you, they, if you can't give them the votes, they're just not really concerned. Even if they're on your side, they say, but I have to get elected again. So yep. please make that the core thing because if our group isn't voting, that's where the passion has to start. Yep. And, and just to, that's a very excellent point. And just to piggyback on that, that's what I talk about, what I'm talking about for increased visibility in the community. It certainly is with outside groups, but going to your elected officials as atheists and saying, here's the number that we have, here are the number of people that are in our community, we're voting, and you're not appealing, you're not reaching out to us at all, you're not doing anything that would lead us to want to vote for you, and hold their feet to the fire and be in constant contact with them, but you have to do it as atheists. That's, that's the key part there. Yes, sir. Nick, would you say that the uh, following is part of what you're talking about, that we should be involved not only with our local atheist group if we've got one, or you know, secular coalition group if we've got one, but also be involved with our local political groups. So whatever political party you might happen to want to be associated with, you know, they have um, meetings that the public is invited to. They have different ways of being organized by county or by local legislative district or precinct committee, and they often have openings for people to become precinct right. committee volunteers, and you can yes. get involved and be there when things come up. Like when my county organization said, maybe we should put all the Christian holidays on our official party website, I said, no, you know, let's we shouldn't keep do more that. open. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now that, and, and if, you're, if, you're, if you're already starting to get involved at the local level, this is a key, this is the next step. This is the next thing to do um, to get involved in politics, especially, um, and within the political parties. There's a uh, tabling out there are the, uh, I think it's the Nebraska Secular Democrats Caucus. Um, they're, they're tabling out there because they're, they're, and they're participating in what um, our friends of the Secular Coalition have called the Party Crashers Project. So they're encouraging people to do what you said. Get involved in the state party, work your way up, attend all these meetings, do all these things, and then sort of infiltrate. And be, but you're doing it, obviously, publicly, but you're, saying there, you're standing there as an atheist saying, here's why we shouldn't do this, or here's why we should do this. 
and, right. and two -way being visible. Two-way communication between us and them. Yes, to have that communication, but also because that's how elected officials are born. Because you start as a precinct captain, you work your way up, now you're a committee member, now you're a committee chair, and now there's somebody's coming to you and saying, you know, you should really run for state house. Or I need you to help me find some volunteers to plug in these signs. 501 C3, Johnson's guess. Amendment, we can't do it. Um, that's all the time I have. Uh, so <laughs> thank you, I'm sorry I didn't get to everyone's question. Uh, I'll, be here all, I'll be here all week. Um, I'll be here for the rest of the convention, obviously, so come give me a chat if you want to talk. Thank you, everybody.